Well, having just studied the somewhat abstract idea of potential, we're now ready to move on into something a little more down to earth. We're going to discuss DC circuits and capacitors, and we're going to start with capacitors. And capacitors are devices that come in all shapes and sizes, as we can see here. And fundamentally, what it is, is simply a couple of conductors separated by a dielectric insulating material. So basically just two conducting plates that are close together and they have a variety of uses. So we're going to define capacitance, consider a few geometries, and then look at some of their applications and their physical characteristics. So a brief overview of capacitors. What do they do? Well they store electrical energy. That's as about as general as you can get. They have a wide use in electronics. A few of those applications are in power supplies where they smooth out a pulsating DC after it's converted from alternating current. Radio and television electronics. Uh, capacitors are used to tune in particular stations and eliminate all the other ones. In computers, lots of use in computers and other general electronic circuits, logic circuits and stabilizing the voltage in various parts of a circuit so that it functions correctly. And here's the symbol for any uh, capacitor, just two parallel lines as a circuit element. Shown here is a real basic power supply. So a power supply has an input alternating current coming in. This is a transformer. The rectifier takes what would initially be a sinusoidal back and forth flow of the charges, flow of the current in the circuit, which is not desirable in most electronic applications. The rectifier takes the bottom half of this and flips it over into the, into the top half. So then you have pulsating direct current. So that's a lot better than alternating current for most electronics. But you don't like this dip because the dip is associated with noise and other drastic, drastically negative uh, effects on the function of the circuit. So you want to fill in this gap. So the capacitor here fills in the gap and hopefully it does it better than this. And usually in actual power supplies there's ways to get it better. But fill in this gap is the idea. So you want a smooth direct current like a battery. Additionally, tuning in a particular radio station. This capacitor here is a variable capacitor. Here's a variable capacitor. Two plates separated from each other and you twist this knob, the tuning knob, and it changes the value of the capacitance. And in association with an inductor, as we'll study later, you get a resonant frequency in here that captures the radio station you're most interested in excluding all the others and then you can listen to your favorite tunes. Here's an example of an amplifier circuit. Whole bunch of stuff going on here. But you'll notice capacitor, capacitor, capacitor is all over the place. That symbol is typical for capacitor as well. For the amplifier to operate properly produce an amplified signal in the output. Here's a capacitor in a circuit there's another one so many examples of this very wide use and so many applications in electronics here's a graphic equalizer circuit and notice the inputs over here different frequency ranges different frequency ranges in hertz or kilohertz and for the signal to pass through where it needs to it needs a capacitor to pass the signals through these are the capacitors here yet at the same time not let interfering direct currents that would wreak havoc or cause problems with the function of the of the main amplifier circuit so there is just another application for capacitors and capacitors come in all shapes and sizes these very large ones are these power electrolytic capacitors are used for power supplies to smooth out that alternating or pulsating direct current. Here's some smaller ones, ceramic, uh, Mylar capacitors, uh, different signaling capacitors for, for lower power electronic applications. 
So let's define capacitance. Capacitance. Charge per volts. Q over VAB. That always works. We know the charge and the associated change in potential. We know the capacity. Now let me try and give you some perspective on that. Think of the charge being drops of water and the capacitor being a bucket of water. And basically the capacitance is measuring how much rise in the level of the water there will be for in the level of the water in the bucket for a certain quantity of water, a certain number of drops. That would be a good analogy. If the rise is small for a given amount of drops, then it's a large capacity. But if there's a large rise for a given amount of charge or water drops, then the capacity is small. Like a sewing thimble, that would have a very low capacity. So if we start putting drops of water into this, the level will rise fairly rapidly. Okay, inverted here. But how about an ocean? Obviously, if we start putting drops into the ocean, you're not going to see any appreciable rise. There's a huge quantity of water can be added with no change in the height of the water. In the electrical equivalents, a large amount of charge can be added to the capacitor without there being a very large change in voltage. So conceptually, that's what we mean by capacitance. Now let's consider a parallel plate capacitor. Here it is. Just two charge plates separated by distance D, and we have a VA and a VB. And the electric field is going to go from plus to minus, so we know that the potential drops as we go in this direction and rises as we go against the E field. Now, the electric field between two parallel plates we've already seen is sigma over epsilon zero. We've done the analysis of that. If you don't remember, put a Gaussian surface in here somewhere and prove it to yourself. Now, VAB, the voltage, is equal to the electric field times D. Remember, integral of E dot DL is equal to VAB. And uniform electric field, parallel plates, it's just E times D, very simple. So E is VAB over D. So there is our definition of electric field. But that's quite a bit different than our sigma over epsilon zero, yet they have to be the same thing. So voltage over distance is sigma over epsilon zero. Now sigma is Q over A. So there we have Q over A over epsilon zero is equal to electric field. Q is equal to then electric field times E I'm sorry, EA epsilon zero is charge. Proportional to the electric field, proportional to the area, and dependent as well on the permittivity of the medium in which this electric field finds itself in, epsilon zero, if it's a vacuum. So now C, Q over VAB, we just define Q, EA epsilon zero. And there it is and over ED, which is VAB. So now we see it's actually electric field independent. It's A epsilon zero over D, which wonderfully is actually a geometric expression for capacitance. So we don't have to worry about the physical quantities and what their values are, just like with a bucket of water. We don't have to worry about how much water there is in the bucket. We don't have to worry about how high the water level has risen for a given added amount, which will give us the capacity of the bucket. But the capacity of the bucket is in independent of those. It's based on you know, the height and the, the circumference. So here's a geometric expression for capacitance. Very useful. Expressed in coulombs per volt. Okay, So coulombs charge in volts, Q over V. And that's equal to a farad. So farad is the special name given for the capacity of a capacitor in coulombs per volts. Well, let's consider the analysis of a couple of geometries, spherical and cylindrical capacitors. So here we have a conductor of charge Q, solid sphere of Q, radius A, and then a cylindrical shell around it conducting radius B and minus Q on it. By the way, capacitors in general, when they're charged, they'll have equal and opposite charges on their respective conductors. Well, C is Q over VAB, 
just to find it. So all we need is VAB because the charge is Q. We're looking at the magnitude of the charge. So let's do VAB. This is familiar to us. Let's integrate the E field. Aha, that's a good idea. So at some radius, let's go ahead and with respect to R, consider that the electric field is KQ over R squared. So we're going to integrate 1 over R squared minus 1 over R. So KQ minus KQ over R from A to B gives us minus KQ 1 over B minus 1 over A. Let's revert, reverse the signs. There we go. And now let's do a little algebra and bring the A and B together as follows, multiplied by B over B and A over A, are the two terms. This gives us KQ B minus A over AB. Now this is just VAB here. So C is equal to Q over VAB. So we're going to take Q and divide it by this and determine the capacitance. So we have C is equal to Q over VAB. Q's go away. Now let's go ahead and reconvert the K to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So we have 4 pi epsilon 0, AB over B minus A. Now 4 pi, 4 pi A squared, that is the surface area of the sphere. The 4 pi B squared is the surface area of the B sphere. And notice what we have here, 4 pi A times B. So there's a linear dimension twice, so it's got the dimensionality of a surface area. And in fact, 4 pi AB is the mean, the geometric mean of the two areas, 4 pi A squared and 4 pi B squared. And then the distance between those spheres is B minus A. So B minus A is the distance between the spheres. Conclusion to all this is with the spherical capacitor, we have that C is 4 pi epsilon 0 AB over B minus A. And that is epsilon 0 times the geometric mean of the area divided by the distance. And that's the exact same form that the parallel plates had. So that's good. Nothing really new here, fundamentally. And we see that C, the capacity, is proportional to the area which is like the size of the bucket, how big the bucket is. And it's also inversely proportional to the distance. So as we get those plates really close together, the capacity goes up. That's pretty interesting. Now notice this is not dependent on the charge or the voltage of the capacitor, even though it can be defined in terms of these. Q over V doesn't have to be. This has none of that in it. So this is true generally. And now let's go ahead and determine the capacity of a cylindrical geometry. So a cylindrical capacitor, we have a cylinder surrounded by a conducting cylinder, cylindrical tube, basically. So radius A and B with L in this case, and here is lambda, so we have a charge per length and a corresponding negative charge per length on the outer tube, thin tube, both conductors. So once again, we'll look at the capacity as being charge per volts, Q over VAB. Now, as we've analyzed before with such a geometry, we typically call the potential at B equal to zero. So let's do that, V is zero at B. And so VAB, we got to solve, which is the integral of the E field from A to B. Now the E field is lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0 R. So lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0 is constant that comes out. Integral of 1 over R is natural log. So we have that. And we have that the charge of this particular segment here is the charge is the charge per length times length. So charge is lambda times L. So C is equal to lambda L, the charge, over VAB. Well, lambdas go away. And we get 2 pi epsilon 0 L over natural log of B over A. Which, if we divide by L, we have the capacitance per length of a 
cylindrical system. It's 2 pi epsilon 0 over natural log of B over A. So that's the, the, the capacitance per meter, so to speak. Now, lest you think that this has no practical significance, it actually does, because if you have some recollection of perhaps the signal cable coming into your house from your satellite dish or probably uh, from your internet to your modem, black cable perhaps, maybe it's white and it strings along, well, maybe you can see it, maybe you can't. I'm sure you've seen that somewhere in your house. That is basically a long cylindrical capacitor. There is an inner and outer conductor separated by a dielectric material, which we'll discuss soon, the dielectric. And so that transmission line, as it's otherwise called, is a simply a large cylindrical capacitor expressed in terms of its capacity per length by this. You don't have to memorize this relationship, but recognize at least that it is common in technological applications.